Awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, this is our first ever Atrium Multifamily Podcast, and we are so excited to be here today. We have the greatest honor of having our first guest, Tito. How's it going, man? Good, man. Thank you for having me. Yes, man. Thanks. Thank you for coming out today. Super excited. Um, so today, man, we really want this podcast to be some insight on multifamily investing and, and apartments and, and development. Um, this is going to be a great chance for us to dive deeper into the industry. And so we have an industry professional. Tito is a broker with the multifamily firm out here in Orlando. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm here in Orlando, but we focus on the uh, West Coast markets like, uh, for example, Tampa, Polk County, Sarasota, Manatee County, basically that whole section. That's kind of our focus, our main uh, market. Awesome, awesome, man. So excited to have you here today. Why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself, man? What's your story? Where are you from? Uh, so I'm from Venezuela. Yeah. Um, I got to the U.S. in 2017. Uh, long story short, it's, you know, they, they made some you know, decisions in the government that, let's say, I, I, I wasn't very fond of. And so, you know, I took a plane and it was it was a very interesting decision and moment in my life. It, it, the economy in Venezuela was not doing well. And so I, I felt kind of stuck. So I came to the States and I was very uh, grateful for the opportunity. Okay. And it's it's been going very well. Um, I started, um, I, ha I had a few jobs, but I, the main thing I did before multifamily was uh, I was a paralegal for a, a law firm for, okay. for a while, for a couple of months. And so just one day, I, you know, after a few years, you kind of set foot in the, the country you're living in. And, you, you know, you have to take a decision what you're going to do next. And, you know, as, as a lot of people, I read uh, Rich That for That. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, it seems that this real estate thing is for me. And I, that kind of like got it started. And so... It's been a interesting journey. It's it's, it's been it, there's moments been difficult, but it's been fun. Awesome. So okay, Venezuela paralegal. Why <laughs> multifamily though? Like I know you said rich dad poor dad, but why multifamily? It's it it was it was a full journey. So I I wanted to get into the real estate uh, business, mm -hmm. you know, and I I wasn't sure how to do it. You know, the, my first idea was just grab you know find an assistant job, learn the trade, learn how it works. But right when I was ma making those decisions, COVID hit. Yeah. So it got really tough. You know, I, I had one, only one interview before like COVID hit and it th wasn't working out. And at the same time, I was planning to get my real estate license like a lot of people do. Yeah. And so, but I had no clue what I was doing. Like no idea how real estate worked. I was just, you know, applying. That was it. I had the idea that a brokerage was an office where it's like very busy and you yeah. start working hard and yeah. and you start day one, you know, making hundreds of calls. And I quickly realized that wasn't the case. Yeah. And so during COVID and once it, you know, kind of like dialed down a little bit, uh, I managed to find a uh, I was trying to do residential um, real estate, but it, it really wasn't for me. Yep. And so I found this job with uh, Raul Frejo, who's a very knowledgeable, extremely successful investor yeah. in, uh, in Osceola County. And, and he's, I consider him my mentor. Okay. And he gave me the shot to work with him. And I worked as a, basically as his assistant, one of his administrative assistants, you know, helping him, him out in his business. And, you know, he owns a great amount of units. And it was eye-opening. You know, he gave me the shot of, you know, looking at the numbers, looking at how the business works from the inside. And mm -hmm. I fell in love. I realized that commercial was my thing. Okay. And that's kind of that's kind of how I, you know, that's a short story. You mm -hmm. know, there's a lot of, there was a lot more into it. There was a lot of failures. There was a lot of hitting walls in that Absolutely. process. But that's kind of how I got into multifamily. Okay, awesome. That's yeah. great, man. I totally understand that having mentors is key. You know, um, I've been blessed to have a lot of mentors in my life as well, and so I totally understand that. And multifamily, it's a great division of real estate to be in, man. Um, so many beautiful projects that you yeah. get to work on. Speaking of projects, why don't you tell us about um, your favorite deal that you've been a part of? That's an interesting question. There is um, there's this deal in Titusville. Mm -hmm. I worked with uh, Joe LaFro and Johnny Pullman. You know, yep. I worked for them for oh my god, they're amazing. Absolutely, that, those are those are my other two mentors, and I almost eighty percent of what I know in multifamily comes from them. You know, and their expertise, and we worked for, in a deal in Titusville. It was, um, if I remember correctly, one hundred and sixty four units. Uh -huh. And it was a very interesting deal because there was 40 bacon units. It was a tough deal. And the owner had basically like an open listing. You know, he, he wanted agents to compete for it. Yep. And I came from, 
smaller brokerages or or I guess the mindset of, you know, you only work if you're exclusively working with an owner. Yep. And they have a different approach. You know, they work hard. They don't care. They they just want to provide value. Mm. And that kind of opened my eyes. We, we did so many tours. We were going and going to the property and showing the property and talking to the property and selling the property. It, I had a great time. Like, I really enjoyed it. And when we finally got it, um, I realized, you know, it, um, there was basically no agreement, but they, they just worked so hard that the owner was so happy and, and the offer we provided was the best. Mm. And so that, that I, it changed my mindset of how you approach these deals. You know, yeah. it's about providing value. Can you, you know, make it happen? Can you, uh, you know, do the work necessary to generate those offers and, and get the best possible offer? And we got the owner like an amazing offer, like something that we were even like, well, I, we weren't sure if we we're going to get those numbers and it was, Pretty crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Really cool deal. Titusville is a market that we know pretty well. Um, we bought a few deals over the last 12 months in Titusville. So that's awesome to hear um, just how close to home it was for us. Um, but you spoke about something that was really interesting to me, and you spoke about adding value. And I think that is one lost thing that we that we don't see as often, you know, in our in our industry, in our market. A lot of brokers are focused on, you know, getting the highest deal um, and just kind of blowing smoke sometimes. And so if you could just talk to me about, you know, your conversation with sellers. How are you managing expectations? I do want to get a little bit more into the market and what you're seeing. Kind of give me some of your thoughts about that. So it's a bit of a, it's a big question. Uh, starting with value. Um, when you start out in, in real estate, it's hard to, pr to understand what is the value, what is your job. And, mm -hmm. and so I think it gets to a point where, you know, if, if I have to, summarize it is giving information to the seller or the owner in this case or the buyer to make a well-informed decision mm. you know you're not there to make the decision for them yeah you're there to give them information so they can make the decision that's good so, uh, a lot of people uh think that it's like oh you have to persuade them and push them and it's like if they're not ready to do take action is because there's something you have not done or you have not explained to them or you have not inquired or done your job properly to understand their needs. Mm. So that's, I think, the, the first step when it provides value. Of course, it's more complicated. You, you can deep, absolutely, you know, you can go deep into it. But that's what I learned in, in, in the last three years of doing this. The second thing, when it comes to seller expectation owners, um, it's tough. It's tough <laughs> because... Appreciate well, the honesty. Yeah, it's, a, a it's, lot of people tell me, oh, it's simple, it's easy. No, it's, I, I, it's tough not because it's, it's complicated, but it's because uh, you, you're in a situation where you have to be very honest with yourself yep. and transparent. And, and I, I wouldn't say honest is the word because you should always be honest, but you should, you should be sincere with yourself and with the owner. And the reason I say sincere is because um, you have to, obviously, you want to get a deal. You want to get the listing. And yep. so you're tempted to say a number just for them to say yes. But I think for me personally, um, it works better when I'm just sincere and transparent, like, look, this is the market, there's a line, right? And this is the number that is very likely we're gonna get. Yeah. I don't wanna like, the word is not lie, but I don't wanna oversell you and and, and, and promise something I can't produce, or maybe, maybe I will, Absolutely. you know, but it's not assured. I prefer to, you know, keep the expectations in reality. And and usually 90% of the time, owners like that. Yeah. They like to hear it because there's so many agents that are just trying to please them versus just saying, hey, man, I like, I, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's a million bucks. Uh, maybe it's not a million. Maybe it's more like 800, you yeah. know. And so that kind of sets the tone. And the second thing you do to set expectations is you're not the one, I'm not the one uh, deciding what the property is value right what i'm doing is i'm looking at the market and looking at the property looking at all the the points the, the you know the characteristics and looking at the market and determining the value doing that so there's there's this misconception that like agents are trying to put you know trying to decide the market value and Absolutely. nobody decides that nobody that's there's, so good it's there's this you know market value in any type of business anything it's a huge amount of like data points that so many people have that not not a single person can can have it so once once you define that line and and you you know as your job as an agent is to 
really know well what that market line is or the price. Yeah. And then after that, you give them all the information. Then your job is to provide value through inform, like giving them the feedback of the market with Absolutely. offers, yeah. with, you know, just feedback about the property. And that way, you know, again, it's not me or agents or, you know, it's the market telling them, hey, look, this is what your property is valued at. Yep. And you kind of, you know, you, you, you follow that, basically that structure, I guess, and, and make it happen. And lastly, when it comes to, you know, I, I, I guess your question is like, why are like certain prices so high? And like, so the other thing is just, it's the market. Like, you know, uh, it, it happens that, you know, I've been surprised before where I think like, oh, this, this is a price that makes sense. It's the yeah. price that when the property cash flows and whatnot, and people come in and just offer more. Mm. So that, you know, you, you know, that's great. You know, it's value for the owner and, and that's what you should be doing. You know, you're trying to get them the best offer possible, but the market is a market. They, it dictates it. So you, I can't, you know, <laughs> that's a, That's such a good point. And I know we'll, we'll have new brokers, brokers who've been here for 10 plus years, kind of listening to this podcast, um, as well as investors looking to buy their next deal. And so you brought up a good point as far as understanding the market. Like you don't decide the market, you kind of just monitor it and kind of commu communicate that to manage expectations. If you could talk to us a little bit about um, your perspective on what is something that you think brokers get wrong or what is something that you think investors get wrong um, when it comes to seeking to purchase their next deal, um, given that they, you know, sometimes don't understand the market as well as you do. You're somebody who looks at, I would guess, thousands of units on a weekly basis. So you see the transactions that's going on. What are some of the things or insights that you're seeing that people might not see or understand? Oh, that's a, well, first a disclaimer, like I've, I've been doing this for a while, but I'm not, <laughs> not close to being like a, you know, 10, 20 years in the business. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, so I'm always very hesitant to tell people oh, they're wrong. Uh, I, I, I guess when it comes to investment, I, I obviously there's things that are blatantly wrong, you know, like there are certain facts of the business, but everybody has their own perspective, investment criteria, and yeah. they have their own style. Um, I would say one of the things I see is there's a lot of, there's a, there's, it happens a lot with kind of the, 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 the radical ends, you know, when you have the new investors mm -hmm. and the old investors or owners, mm -hmm. you know, it, when you're right in the middle, they're actually, you know, the people who've been this in like not so long, but not so little, like right in like the five year mark, they've been, you know, they're actively, they understand the market because they're more like connected to the market. So the new investors, you know, they do a great job. They, they try their best to get informed, go to um, a meetups and go to a conventions and whatnot. Um, and they start studying underwriting. And I yeah. think that's the first thing. You know, they, they underwrite deals. They do a great job. They're, they're trying to be safe. And sometimes they, they just, they're over conservative. Uh, uh. They're over, they're too conservative with their underwriting. Like expenses and stuff. Yeah, and expenses. Yep. You know, the expense issues are, are very high. And that's understand. I would be too, you know. It's, Absolutely. You're, you're starting an investment. You don't want to make a mistake. It's a lot of money. Completely understandable. And there's deals that kind of fit that. But th with time, they start realizing that the, there's a market line. And so unfortunately, you know, if you're too low, you know, there is going to be one in a hundred. You're going to find a great deal. You know, those deals, that, the, the deal that everybody is looking for that, like deal that it's going to make money no matter, no matter what. Yeah. But they're, you know, they're far between. There are not a lot of them. And so if you really want to get into a business, you're going to have to make some concessions and you're going to have to like, okay, accept, not accept, but like take the reality of the market and adapt your strategy mm. accordingly. That doesn't mean you're going to do a bad investment. You right. should never buy a property that you believe is not a good investment. Absolutely. Um, but that's important, you know, and, and the second one is the older owners, you know, mm. the older owners, you know, have owned the property for so long, especially right now that, you know, in, between 2020 and 2022, there was this crazy increase in, in value and, and, and rents and all that. And so if you've been, and I understand it too, you, if you've been working for 10 years, you know, and the median price for the last 10 years of a unit has been 80, Seventy thousand dollars, right? And in a year, you you tell them, oh, now it's one hundred and fifty. You know, I would be like, what? <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I completely understand where how they feel, and they they're hesitant to make other, you know, decisions and whatnot. And that's Absolutely. your job to kind of inform them slowly, you know, provide actual statistics about the market. Um, you know, the the 
you know, comps and whatnot, rent comps and all that. But it's normal. It's like, you know, they worked in an industry that every year was, let's say, rent increases were 5% or 2% right. a year. Yeah. And all of a sudden it went for 20%, 25%. Absolutely. So I would be also kind of worried. I'm like, ah, dude, dude, like, is this, what is this? Is you know? it sustainable? Yeah. Is it sustainable? Yeah, exactly. So I think those are the two, more than mistakes, I think it's just perspective. You know, it, right. it's tough. You know, when you've been a long time, when you're new, you kind of have to kind of go in the center and adapt and 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 kind of understand what's going on. I think mm. that's the main thing I see. That's really good, man. I think that's going to help a lot of you know new investors seeking to get their first deal. Um, a lot of brokers who are trying to navigate the changing market, man. If you think about it, two years ago, rent spiked tremendously, and you know it was easy to sell deals. I yeah. feel, and then within the last, I would say, twelve months, as rent has calmed down a bit. Um, it's been a lot more intentional that you have to have in those conversations with sellers and managing expectations and just be on the same page. So I think that was some great insight. Um, you brought up one thing earlier as far as your story. And you know, I really want to highlight that as well as with, with all our guests. I think that provides so much value to our listeners. And so I want to ask you a question. Um, here at Atrium, we're big on defining our why, right? We're big on understanding why do we do what we do, what wakes us up every day, you know, what helps us, what motivates us, what encourages us to be the best version of ourselves. And so I kind of want to ask you, man, along the lines of what is your why or what is a defining moment for you in your career that kind of helped you find your why? Mm, that's a, I would say um, the reason I, I got into multifamily and, and started, you know, doing this, specifically this job, which is kind of your own, um, small business a lot of people like to say it's like it's your own little small business but yeah it's more like you're you're working independently it's because i wanted to have more liberty mm -hmm. more freedom right you know um a lot of people call it financial freedom but at the end of the day i wanted uh, a a job that allowed me to grow exponentially mm -hmm. you know a, a lot of careers have very low ceilings yep and also just be able to be in a position to invest and um, and take advantage of that because I, I don't see myself retiring mm. like I'm, I'm actually the opposite like there's a lot of people who want financial freedom yeah to retire and whatnot yep but for me it's more about I want to be able to take a decision let's say uh, one day I want to focus on X project yep. you know and be able to do that calmly like with, with no issues just be able to snap and say oh you know what i want to work on this i want to i don't know write a book whatever it is and that's kind of my main why of doing this mm -hmm. and so that's that's my main uh driver i mm -hmm. guess um that i just want to be more free to m make those decisions you know in 10 years if i you know not that i'm tired of multifamily but if i want to in start investing in something else having that ability that to choice. just do it that yeah. choice for me that's extremely valuable that's you know? that's huge you know in the book you brought up earlier rich dad poor dad mm -hmm. i feel like that's a lot of what robert kiyosaki speaks about is yeah the the ability to live life on your own terms because of your financial decisions and i definitely think multifamily investing and, and being a broker helps you um do that in, in an expedited way i would say you know you, you always just want to have that choice to to choose how you use your time you know what you do on a daily basis how you can affect and help your family. So I totally get that. It makes so much sense. I think that's a great answer too. Um, a lot of people, you know, say they want that, but you know, you're actually showing us how we can do that being a broker, investing in multifamily real estate. And so I think that's very cool to see it done practically. Um, but it actually brings me up to my last question. I know we're running out of time here, but um, we always like to ask our guests, what is your famous business book and why? Now I know you mentioned Rich Dad Poor Dad. <laughs> you can use that answer again. I just want to be clear. That is a great book. I think it's been on the bestsellers list. For like the last 20 30 years so i wouldn't be mad at you but <laughs> if you could just tell us your favorite your favorite business book and why you love it and how it has impacted you i think uh, it's gonna be it's definitely gonna be uh jocko willing's book of mm. extreme ownership Ex mm. like that that book it's yes uh rich that portal is a great book yeah i think it's a great mindset book uh if anybody reads it i i, I think it's just the mindset that he's teaching is what it's important not, not so much that the fact that he 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 i think it's a coincidence that he's in the real estate business yep. more than the actual mindset he's teaching um i think for me it's extreme ownership because it's what i think what you want when you do any business endeavor or project yeah is a philosophy that you can go through life you you kind of have to 
change your mindset of how you approach things, you know, and you have to have a lot of agency and a lot of initiative in how you approach life in general. Um, especially like, you know, when, when for me, the reason that that book spoke volumes to me is because, you know, I, I was in a situation where, you know, the whole environment, the whole country was not doing well. Right. And so you kind of feel that the world is like, oh, you know, you don't have you don't have opportunities. You you kind of you 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 lose agency. You lose your capability of taking action, and that's not true necessarily. You're all, even if it doesn't seem like it, you always have control of what you're doing and what you're going through life. Absolutely, amen. And so that book kind of defined it for me because when I got here, the first few months, I was in a little bit of victim mentality, like, oh, I'm an immigrant. You know, I'm, you know, I'm struggling. I don't have the money, and I. I, you know, you, you can always go like, oh, if the, the, if the country would have, you know, not gone you know, down, you know, I would have had a great life because I was going to college and whatnot. But the reality is you're here now and that's it. Yep. And so that book, I think it's excellent because it teaches that, that you always have to own your decisions, Absolutely. own what you're doing. There's no excuse. Um, it's, of course, you can apply as radical as you want to be. I think obviously there's going to be, there, it's, it's not about you, you know, it's not about telling yourself you, it's your fault. You're just saying like, look, this happened, you know, let's say a car accident, you know, you can't do anything. Someone, you know, drive into you. Yeah. Now your car is screwed up. Now maybe you, you, you know, there's your health is not great, but it's just, Hey, you have to own it. You have to keep going. You have to take ownership of the moment. Say, how can I, you know, fix this problem? Absolutely. And it's, it's been extremely valuable for me. Man, I love that so much. That's a uh, that's one thing that we try to preach to our team team members here is, you know, you're responsible for everything that happens to you, and that is extreme ownership. I think that's how Jocko sums it up in the book, and I think it's such a a valuable lesson and thing to understand when it pertains to, you know, your career, but also your life, man. Like our lives shape our our environments and the world around us, and man, if we can just get rid of that victim mindset and just just yeah. I always say take ownership of everything that happens to us. We can it's truly not be easy. successful, man. It it's, is not. That's true. It's not easy. It's it's I you know just a disclaimer. It's like it's easier said than done. It's Absolutely. not like <laughs> it's not like I read the book and now oh, I'm done. Like no, there's days that, you know, it's easier is easier to say when you know you're having a great day, everything's flowing, but when things don't work out for you, you know, you start hitting walls and and you know you fail in certain stuff. That's when it's really difficult. That's when you have to push it and kind of like maintain that focus. You know, um, but it's this this is an interesting journey that taught this business because you have to be self-disciplined. You have to kind of like apply that to yourself. Man, that's awesome. I really appreciate you coming out here today, man. Yeah. I feel like we got some great content. I feel like everyone who watched this will have a better understanding of what it takes to be a successful broker, what it takes to be a multifamily investor and kind of just the ins and out of living a productive and successful life. So thank you so much for coming here, man. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Thank time. you for having me. Awesome. That is it. Our first ever podcast, man. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Um, be on the lookout for more on our multi-family series. We really appreciate you guys. Thank you again, man. Yeah. This podcast was produced by Atrium Management Company. Thanks for tuning in. And don't forget to like and subscribe.